See green light on that guy? Yes. That should be a Chapter 1 and this question how semiconductors are different from conductors or insulator. What are some similarities? So, you need to upload these answers on Blackboard in one PDF file. So, if you submit five files, the system doesn't just download me one file, so upload one PDF file. If you have problem, or you want to know how to create a PDF file, ask GT. It will help you to do that. So, so these questions come from the book. One is from a simple question in your understanding. So this is a paper that I want you to read before we get into oxidation. So this is something we expect to get into next week. All right, so we're going to talk about clean room. What are some basics on the clean room? How do we do entry and then what are points to remember? Of course, you have gone through these in the training. But there's always somebody who has some concerns, questions, and wanted to bring it up. So there is certain dress code that you have to follow. There is order of things that you do. Walking on mats, on the sticky mat especially. How do we do the governing? So the process is called governing, where you have to dress up in a certain order, put on shoe covers, and so on. And then there's air shower that we have to take. We have to stand there and, and rotate so all the particles from even the uh, cover up they are flown away, blown away, and then we enter from that door and we exit from the other door. And there's how do we exit? That also requires certain process. But before we leave, we swipe the card so there's the count is accurate on how many people are there. So, of course, no food or drink, nowhere up past that first door after that sticky pad. You don't carry anything in there. Of course, cosmetics contain chemicals. We know now about nail polish, we have seen examples of nail polish. So, cosmetics, it's don't have the makeup because those chemicals may react with fumes or vapors of, of chemicals that we use. And if you have bags, books, can put them in lockers. They are placed beyond that door. If you are facing towards the clean room and elevator is on your back, there is a double door in your left. Past that door, there are lockers on the right side. Place your stuff in this locker. You can lock them. 
and leave everything outside before you go inside. Right, so take your time. So if you have any questions, always email us. We can get you the same page on the the downing and cleaning process or on the, on the preparation, how do we go inside and how do we get out of there, right? Why do we do all that? So, so to keep the, the, to maintain the integrity of the cleaner. First, the question is, what do we mean by clean? So clean is, we don't want any of the particles Thank from you. outside to go inside. So we want to restrict the size of particles that are there in the, in the air because they will contaminate not just the, the process, the, the, the devices, the, the wafers. And there's, there are limitations on, on all the things that we can or cannot do. There are three basic types of contamination. Physical particles which may land on a surface films or trace elements. So some can be, some are visible, some are not. So we can see particles. How do we see particles? Okay. Which microscope? Just hold the wafer and look at it. But what is the smaller size? Smaller size probably that we can see with, visit with bare eyes. Microns, 10 microns, yeah, that's about the 5 to 10 micron is what we can see as a, if it's a line we can see 5 micron easily, but if it's a, it's a speck, if it's a particle which is, probably you won't be able to see that. So what do we do? What can be first step of looking at the wafer? Optical microscope. Optical microscope, just put it in and scan the area at low magnification, right? So that can show you many things. Layers of foreign materials, the films, those are the, the chemicals that might leave some traces behind. Where can oil come from? Our hands. Hands. Right? So we always have secretions. Of course, we never have bare hands inside the cleaner. Right. But if a glove tears apart, we have to change our glove. If we don't step out of the clean room to get a new glove, we can put a new glove while in. But there's always a chance that we might. We can sneeze, we can cough, so things come out. So there are certain things that we do to get rid of chemicals. If we do some solvent, Clean. Then there is a series of solvents that we use. So one would take care of or clean, remove the previous solvent, and ultimately we do a deionized water wash. So we we'll look at what is deionized water. Why do we want to use this? Trace elements. Of course, if you leave some metallic ions. When you're talking about ions, it might not be a film. Maybe some metal will be there on the surface, you won't see it. Once you do a high temperature process, what happens to metals? What happens to everything that we heat above melting temperature? Melt your Melts, right? Turns into vapors. And something that is free to go, free to roam around in gaseous state, what it can go and you can see within the, the hard material. It's not easy, but it happens. So we'll see what is that phenomena when something moves against the gradient of concentration. So, of course, if there are metals, we cannot heat the substrate chip wafer up to high temperature because that's going to melt it. So melting is, is, is very important topic. So if a metal melts in a, in a high temperature process, it's not going just going to degrade the substrate, the electrical properties of the material, it's going to contaminate the container also. It's going to contaminate the chamber of the process. So if I have a machine, say oxidation furnace, 
right? So it's a it's a tube, quartz tube. If I use a wafer and I had metal on there and I heat it up to thousand degrees centigrade, the whole furnace tube will get these ions incorporated. So now if I if I, if the next person puts his silicon wafer and does oxidation, those wafer are gonna get these ions incorporated, metallic oil. So do we want semiconductor material to have metallic ions? No, that's gonna change the whole electrical property. So we we that we call it contamination sites. For a layman, it's not a big deal, but for devices, it's contamination. It's a huge issue. Right? There are in some other cases there are other types of contaminations which we are not concerned in space application, what can be other types of contamination? Space applications? Space application. When you, you send a whole rocket up in the space, it has electronics, right? It has devices and semiconductor based materials. What are the issues there? Radiation. Radiations. Right? They can be UV radiation, other type of radiations which can change the electrical properties of those devices. So, is that really co uh, uh, contamination or is that? It's a major area of research. How do we control radiation contamination, this contamination? Right. So, what are sources of contamination? The equipment itself, because in, in any given equipment, we have number of gases coming in, reactions happening, products coming out of that reaction, and we have to remove those products. Some of those reactions may be highly corrosive. They might react with the, with the material of the chamber, with the material of the encapsulating uh, container of the, of the equipment itself, right? So we, most of those chambers are Inert for what reactions we do in there, but there is always some sort of etching or deposition happening. So it may not just remove the surface material, it may deposit something there, which may become an issue when the next person uses that equipment. Those deposited materials might degrade the next process. Liquids and gaseous chemicals. So they are gases flowing through, they are liquids going through, they can carry those contaminants. People are major source of contamination because we are always inhaling, exhaling. We have particles, skin coming out of, things coming out from our skins, which can be major issue for devices. Because devices are small, they're smaller than micron. Chemical and wafer containers, so the containers that we use to move the wafer around. In your case, it would be your tweezers, because you'll be holding your wafer with tweezers. So if your tweezers is not good, it's not clean, it's going to screw up your wafer. Now think about it. Have to be very careful. Have to be, I would say, use common sense. So if I'm using this tweezer to hold my wafer, and I push, I put the wafer in a holder, right? Now what do I do with it? Can I hold it in my ear? Can I put it on the bare surface table? Can I put it in my pocket? Can I put it in a tissue paper? Can I? Can I put it in a tissue paper? Roll it in a tissue paper? Just tell me, can I so can I put it on my ear? Why not? I'm contacting with lots of oil and skin flakes. Now you don't know what's on the tweezers is more important. Yes, that's the other way around that. Do I want this to be in contact with me? And then that's do I really, that's from my point of view. Right now I'm talking about tweezers point of view. Do I want to put it on, on just bare surface? I don't know what else has gone before on that surface, right? I'm going to put it in my pocket. I don't know what all I've been putting it there. 
So we always use containers to store them. We always use containers. Right? Use a test tube. Clean the test tube before you, you start doing your processing. You need to have those squarish containers. So always after you process, it goes into a container, a closed environment. So clean room is clean, but then we have many more further micro environments inside the clean room, which are further clean which are cleaner than the environment itself of the clean room. So anything that comes into contact of a, a contact to a wafer, you have to think about it, where has that thing been? So if you don't know, clean that tweezers, clean that container. So there are many types of things we use to handle wafers. Tweezers are one, and we have something like something, a, a handle where we have, so this guy is something, they have grooves here, so what we do is we put a wafer here and we push this down, so this also have groove. So now this guy is something which we can use to hold and dip into a solution, the whole wafer would dip, right? So this comes here and so we are holding wafer from three corners, that holder needs to be clean, right? Because the back side is, so of course front side would be the shiny side, but back side is coming in contact with this holder itself, right? The edges are coming in contact here, so the holder needs to be clean. How do we clean? So we'll see what are the requirements of cleaning. Just like we do dishes where we put some soap, then we rinse it with running water, we call it clean. That's clean enough for food. For these, there are certain steps we have to do with certain chemicals for them to be clean. For air, there is always air circulating in clean rooms. So there are HIPAA filters. What does HIPAA stand for? High efficiency particulate? Yeah. Something. So we'll see what are HIPAA filters. So, and air is, the air flow is always, what do you call it? Turbulent and laminar flow. Yes, have you heard of turbulent flow and laminar flow? Mechanical engineer, right? So, what is turbulent flow? So, when if you break down the the flow fluid flow into the, the lines of particles, they don't have any order; they are random, right? So, that's turbulent flow. But laminar flow is when everything flows in straight line, right? So, flow is much more aligned. We always want to have laminar flow inside the clean room. So, so the, the whole air is always being pushed up, pass through HEPA filters and coming through the, the floor again. In the, this is general environment and then we have these sort of uh, wash basins, you can call them, but places where we do chemical processing, these are called hoods. So hood has further uh, an isolated flow within that thing. A hood is nothing but a window, you open the window and there is this working room inside that. And we stand there and we do everything inside that hood. There are, so the flow of hood is that local air is moving up. So whatever chemical I use, the fumes are not coming to me. They are going within that, that localized airflow. So we maintain laminar flow within the hoods also. Would the, what do you think, the airflow of hood will be mixed with the common airflow of the clean room? It's not. That is because it has many more vapors of chemicals. So that's treated separately and, and sent out. Right? So, and then of course, we have handling, of course, these are the handling things, tweezers and all those which can bring in chemicals. So, we give 100,000 to 1 million particles per minute. That's human. And city air has 5 million particles per cubic feet. These are common words. So if somebody says 
shoe cover, booty, gloves, coverall, face mask, hood, cap, safety glasses, you should know what does that. Right? That, and of course, you all will be given one to get into the clean room. What can films do? So, you guys moved out of apartments and cleaned the grease from the cooking range. It's, it takes an effort, right? Some of you have been here less than a year, haven't changed an apartment yet, but when you clean the cooking range, the stove, this grease, right? Have to use certain chemicals to remove it, but some are hard to remove. <coughs> Same way, the reactions that we do, some of the those reactions result into films. When they get deposited, it's very hard to remove them. You get some tissue from uh, contamination. Thank you. You're contaminating the classroom. I have. Coke is addictive. Or not? Not corrosive. So those films can ultimately result into into degrading the cleaning process. So if you want to use run-of-the-mill standard cleaning process, they might not be effective. So you want to do aggressive cleaning process, they might affect the features that we have on the on the, on the wafer. So they become an issue in cleaning. And if I have silicon and I want to apply photoresist, and we discussed about photoresist, we, we spin it or all that. So, we know what photoresist will stick well to silicon <coughs> substrate, right? But if there is a film in there which has, I don't know what in there, it won't stick well. So that's a very simple example, but there are much more, many more things, example that we'll see once we get along. And some of the things can chemically change on the substrate. So that's on the films. Elements can diffuse in the silicon and degrade device properties. Again, transistor, remember always transistor, we need to have control over the gate. If I can't switch it on and off, it means I'm losing control over the gate. And, and this can happen. So if I if I do this and flip it and nothing happens, it means I don't need it. it it's not giving me any control over the whatever connection is going to make. So same in transistor, if I cannot switch the gate on and off to make the device connect, I am losing gating effect. That can happen with trace elements. Particles, again, when I do masking, it's a physical transfer of design pattern. If my resist has incorporated some something physically there, it will not result into accurate transfer of the image. So think about it, if I have, if, I, if on a surface I had this, I wanted to make a square from a mask by shining light, right? So if I had a speck somewhere here, a particle, and I did my lithography, I will get something like that, because this will stay there. Right? So my image transfer would be not exactly what I had here. So if I had a square here which I wanted to transfer. And which can ultimately result into defects into the films that we deposit or lines that we make. So it can degrade the features that we make. And we defined the size of particles to be killers. They are how much? 20 to 50 percent of minimum feature. Now there are few new terms here. What is minimum feature size? As a designer, I make all sorts of components, resistors, capacitors, right? Channel length, source and drain. There is always something that is smallest in feature size, which I want to be transferred faithfully from mask to wafer. 
So that is the smallest feature size. And that will define what technology I will use, so what node I will use, so to speak. That, like we discussed, there was 65 nanometer node. and So that minimum feature size will define what particle size can be allowed in that room. So even if we call it clean room, it's all, it always has some of it. But we get rid of most of those above certain size. And that defines a term called class. Class 1000 clean room, class 100 clean room, class 10 clean room. Right? So what does a class tell us about a clean room? How many particles are there? How many particles are in there? Right? Right? Not exactly. How many particles of what minimum size would be in there? Right? So it's not just how many we can clean, it's it's that what size we want to really get rid of. How do we get rid of different size materials? What do we what's that process called filtering, right? So we have filters. What is a filter? How do we define a filter? And remove something. So it's a barrier which has size exclusion, a membrane which has certain holes of sizes. So above that, hole size will stay on the membrane, but the filter, everything else can pass through. So you can exclude certain size, above certain size. So that's what we want to do in a clean room. So the smaller the feature, the smaller the feature, the smaller is the requirement. The, the higher is the requirement should be, and more difficult it is to maintain. So because those filters will be special, they have to be maintained because after a certain time filters get clogged, we have to measure the filters are doing what they're supposed to. And so it, it makes it more stringent as we go down in that. So with the technology being pushed, having much, many more devices, much more dense device design, we are increasing the number of devices from 4K to 16 megabyte and all the way down. Our feature sizes are going down and so are our killing defect size going down. Right? So we have to make sure particles above this size are filtered. <coughs> so this is an example, of not a very inspiring example, but an example of something that we can all relate. So this is more of a laminar flow, and then it becomes a turbulent flow, right? For some distance, the smoke stays laminar, moving in one column, one line, and then it becomes <coughs> turbulent. So. We have these HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate attenuation filters. They get rid of particles of certain sizes, above certain sizes. Then we want to measure from the air, we want to measure temperature, humidity, chemicals. If there is a leak in a, in a system, in some tubing, that chemical will end up in that air of the room. We may not be able to smell some gases or feel some of that, but we have sensors who would look for those. So that air is not just filtered, it is sampled also for all these things. So if we're actually smelling chemicals in the clean room, does that mean the clean room is not as clean as we think it is, or is it that the smell is the particles that we smell are too small to matter for our devices. Well, uh, do we smell things in the clean room? That's what you're saying? No, what, what I'm saying is if, if the clean room is filtered, you know, um, yeah, and times per minute, however many that is, we shouldn't be smelling any of the chemicals, right? Or is that not the the filtration is for particles, I see. not for chemicals. Right. Can you filter chemicals out of air? You can, probably not easily. You can, you can absorb them. But filtering? I see. Right? 
we, we, we put baking soda in our refrigerators. What does that do? I don't know. I've always wondered <coughs> that. It sucks. It absorbs those odors. Odors are chemicals. It, it absorbs those. Yeah. Yes, sir. Don't know. We, they, they use, we put baking soda, just open the container and put it in the freezer and, and main refrigerator. It sucks uh, all the orders from stuff that we put in. But we look for things that we don't want in the, in the environment of the clean. Why temperature is important? Unwanted reaction, okay. But we do many wanted reactions in there. What does temperature do in reactions? It controls the rate. Changes the rate, right? So we, all of the processes that we do, they are, we are doing reactions essentially. We want to control the rate. We want to know exactly how fast, how slow it will go, right? So only then we can set up the parameters for the reaction and expect certain results at the end. What does humidity have to do? Photoresist essentially is as a very, very fundamental process that we do, photolithography, in which we apply photoresist on the paper. That stickiness of resist or its exposure or its development is highly impacted by humidity. So lithography, you'll see, but I've seen it many times, students would say, oh, I did lithography like five times and nothing worked. And I said, did, what was the humidity in the room? So every photoresist, every process has a humidity range that it will behave in that. But if you're above or below, it's not good. It's not going to work. So many times we shut down clean rooms if humidity goes way up or down. Happens a lot in Texas. We are seeing that, right? So in, within one day it can fluctuate heavily. And it depends on, so there are certain things which we can control, certain things which are, if you want to control them, you need specialized equipment, which we may not have. So humidity, I've seen many clean rooms cannot control humidity very effectively the outside humidity changes too much. So we look at those, we see for vibration in clean room, we see for electrostatic buildup. Why would be vibration important to monitor in a clean room? Exposure. 4,000 RPM. Where do we do 4,000 RPM? We rotate things at high speeds. Spinning for photoresist application, right? Gave you that example. So you don't need vibrations here, right? What happens if you are spinning something at such high RPM and you have vibration? Do you think it's going to stability? Stability. So you have this moment of inertia, right? So if you have an unbalanced axis, what's going to happen? There are going to be unbalanced forces on the wafer, and whatever vacuum you apply, your wafer is going to fly away. And here goes your one year of your hard work on that devices you have been making. Right? So we want to control vibration. More importantly, when we do microscopy, especially electron microscopy, which are huge machines and we are magnifying at, I don't know, 80,000 times. So we are really going down on magnification. If there is vibration in this, in the platform, and the floor, it was very hard to focus your microscope, electron microscope, right? So we need to control vibration. Charge buildup, again, when you are doing your processes, wafer has to be, has to have controlled charge. We do, we, we, we do bias our wafers during many processes because we want the reaction to happen fast enough. So we do, we do bias them. If we have a, a positive one that we want to react on the surface, we may bias it to negative bias to the substrate. So we don't want uncontrolled charge buildup as well. So there are two types. One is pH where you have a whole floor 
when we have equipment we have and the auxiliaries pumps power supplies are at a different level so that's called a ballroom type of cleaner or we have something what is the case here we have two different sort of walkways so one is which is part of the clean room and you have front end of all the equipment then the next one is within a door it's not clean enough it can contains all the auxiliaries pumps uh, power supplies cylinders so it's on the same floor so that is one is called bay where we work the other one the servicing place is called the chase we seldom go into chase we will never go into chase if there is a problem we tell the, the equipment manager they will go into the chase we work in the base right so there are two types of so this is something which is again showing the air is coming very oh, i did say opposite before so air is coming from the top being sucked through the the bottom and serviced again through filters and coming back in, in there right so this is an example of a bay and chase in questions you guys will be seeing that very soon so you guys will be getting into the thing so maybe some of it will seem strange we will be spending lots of time in there so i want you to know something do we need to get our own tools or anything you'll be given everything yeah. Need yeah what you were supposed to bring yourself i told you will get you everything else so about goggles we'll have goggles mm -hmm. yeah yeah like right. So this is ballroom and beaches where you have the cabinets, controls, all in one part. And then next one is where you go. You go front end of those equipment, all the machines, and, and same it repeats, right? So this is where you have microscope, everything, and, and the, the chase is what you have all the auxiliaries for that equipment. So as I said before, within clean room we have then further smaller cleaner environments, right? Your tweezer goes into a case. Can be a a test tube. You guys have seen test tubes, right? Test tubes in high school chemistry. So if you put a cap on the test tube, you can use that to store a tweezer. I always used to do that with a wire and a tweezer, but that is so of course you clean your test tube before you start doing that so that is it and then you put a cap on it now you can put that tube anyway your tweezer is not coming in contact similarly for wafers we put them always in a container we never leave a wafer unattended unless it's in a box closed tightly we don't move wafer by holding it in an open environment from one place to the other you always put it in a container close the container and you move the container for industry they don't work on one wafer at a time they have cassettes big cassettes which have multiple wafers in there and the whole cassette is moved from one place to the other and every module has this receptacle where you where it It, it captures the cassette and then takes one wafer out at a time, or whatever the case may be. So these are called SMIF standard mechanical interface, where you have this box and wafers inside. What we will use here, something like this, or or a single wafer carrier. For your case, it will be a single wafer carrier. It will have a base and a top, right? So the top will be screwed in. It's screwed in, opposite to standards. So it's screwed in like this, screwed off like this. We are used to screwing in things like this and screwing off like this. So we always place wafer in there, close the cover before we take it to the other place. Sometimes you may have something called a spider. So spider is a again a plastic thing. It's made of uh, what do you call it? Teflon. plastic key material and we'll tall work that one so what it does is it's a, it's a spring type of thing you put it there and when you close it 
pushes the wafer down. So wafer cannot, has no play within the carrier. So from open boards and cassettes, they have moved in industry to what you call the pods or this boxes, mechanical boxes which hold them in. Each, thing, each machine can interface with them and get those wafers out of them for whatever processing and push it, put them back in there. So this is what you call mini environment or micro environment for the for the substrates of the wafers. So this is on the clean room. So it's particle size and the total particles per meter cube. That is what defines class one, class 10, class 100, class 10,000. So it's not just how many particles, it's the size of particles. So if we push down to the smaller particles, it's we are a little bit <coughs> relaxed on how many particles can be allowed. Right? So if what class do we have here? What's the class of our clean room? I think 10,100, right? 1,000? 100? 100,000. 100,000? 100,000? Some parts are 100, some parts are 1,000. What is teaching path? I think it's 1,000. Right? So what does class 1,000 would mean? Look at the plot. A class 1,000 would mean look down and see starts from here, goes down, so Bigger particles are way smaller in their quantity. Make sense? This plots make sense? So bigger particles <coughs> are much less in number. Right? So and then we go all the way to <coughs> what size? Point one micro? How much is one point one micro? 100 nanometer, right? How many do we allow? 10 is per? A little close to 100, a million, right? It's, as the size goes small, it becomes hard to filter them. In class, maintaining that integrity is not always only the filtering, it's user's behavior also. It's not always just how good the equipment works, it's how good the users are. You'll see people doing stuff that you would want to pull your hair off. And they'll be qualified and they'll be publishing papers, but you see their behavior in the clean room, they don't use common sense. They, so people are major contributor to degrading the class. right? You won't be able to comprehend what I'm saying, but you'll see things that you do, people. There is a there is a path through in the clean room. You guys seen that? You must have been told about that during training. What is path through? Is it where the air is blowing? It's, it's a, a little it's a it's a small the window room. in the in the wall. So it's used to if, if you want to move something in or out, you don't hold it and you step out. You open, so it has two doors, one in the clean room, the other one to the outside. Those two doors cannot be opened at the same time, right? <laughs> See, so what you do is you place stuff in there from one side, you close this one, once you get inside, you close, open the others and you take it out. You don't leave your stuff in there, right? Because that can contaminate other people's stuff, whatever they're, they're moving. You'll see many things there. Sometimes they're open for both sides. We maintain positive pressure inside the clean room. What does that mean? More pressure than the environment. So inter inside is pressurized. So we can always. Why do we pressurize clean room? So that dust from the outside doesn't blow so in. Outside it, it, air doesn't come in. So even if there is a yeah, opening somewhere, air is always moving from in to out, then out to in, right? So it may feel strange to some of them if they have uh, 
sensitive right, sensitive to pressure but get used to it sometime so this is an example of the what I was saying the, the hood chemical hood where we work on chemicals doing process on our wafers common sense so when you look at the hood there are roofs there are holes maybe on the side of the working area but of course we have you want that continuous working space to put your beakers your chemicals your bottles your whatever you'll see some people would leave their kim wipes kim wipe is sort of a like we have uh, napkins or wipes so these are special wipes which are used inside the game they don't have loose uh, what do you call metals what is like this the thing that fibers fiber they don't have loose fiber so you use special kind of wipes in there because if fibers come off they are also contamination there right so should we leave something to restrict those holes that's going to if you do that i'm basically breaking the the laminar flow in the inside the hood if i do that the vapors are going to come to the, to me yes i'm not making I'm not letting the air flow in a continuous flow so you see those things and you have to be careful you have to be use common sense that should this be done or not then on the hood they have these markers maybe by the manufacturer may be written by the staff where well, they'll put an arrow and they'll say the hood should not be opened above this the hood is a window which can be which can go up down like this and it has these the glass doors which can be sl slide to side so it says you should not move it above this you should not move it above this. because if you do that then the flow is the air is coming out of the hood as well and you don't want that so those are many environments that you want to maintain where within the hood you want to maintain the flow of air you guys have seen this rule a a a right triple a always add this what does that mean never add water to acid if there is acid supposed to go into some solution we always add acid we never add something to acid make sense we never add something to acid discuss that that if you do that then you have the whole acid mass to start reaction so blows up so we add acid so the reaction continuously takes perfect whatever speed it has to achieve so how do we clean things so we we all agree we need to clean yeah. we have to stay clean i don't mean that what you are thinking we have to keep the gowns and our receptacles whatever we use clean for reasons that we have discussed how do we clean all those things okay why do you want to clean so a quarter of steps in a fabrication run are just cleaning so we take the substrates out of the one process we clean so many times we have to clean which is necessity we might have done some reaction with an alkali solution in order to neutralize it what are alkali solutions H to H greater than seven. H greater than seven. Basic solution, right? KOH has potassium hydroxide. Potassium is considered a metal. It can degrade device if it seeps within the substrate. So before I do any high temperature process, I want to neutralize any potassium if it is there on the substrate, right? So cleaning is not just always cleaning. We have to neutralize some chemicals that might have been come in contact with the substrate. So it can be carbon, 
left over from polymer from some reaction which <coughs> happened before can be particles can be films can be oil so we need to be, be clean after almost every major process and water is one very important agent that we do for cleaning but water itself is not clean as such we have to clean it we have to deionize it what are things in water what are the things in water that can be problem for processing of course ions deionize it means we want to get rid of ions what else can be there in water salts salts yeah deionization yeah, salts become yeah, ionized can have particles particles organic particles organic particles what else when you say clean drinking water are we talking about particles we talk about living things in water minerals is again salts or So type of area for so so living things in water that. right want to get rid of all these things ions salts or minerals particles living things organic chemicals too yeah. organics very important organics because what is an organic material that contains carbon and we say carbon everywhere carbon can make a film which is become hard to remove so get or to get rid of organic materials we do on site di treatment so these these dif water systems can be as small as a bench top to a something that fills up a room depends on throughput and the quality that we want the throughput is probably more important many times in literature you'll see water to be written as 18 mega ohm centimeter water was used so it's a it's a measure of, of removing ions right because water pure water is what do you think pure water is conductive or not not no. pure water is not conductive and 18 mega ohms per centimeter conductive so it's very resist- resistant right. So pure water is not conductive. What causes the conductivity through water? Sodium. Sodium. Chloride. Chloride. Salts, right? So salts. Anything that can ionize into. So we want to get rid of that because we don't want those salts to be there. The very many reasons why we don't need salt. First is of course if you the salts they can contribute alkaline ions and they can degrade devices right what happens when you when you dry uh, water solution sodium chloride water solution what happens what is left behind residue crystals residues films right that they that they become they become particles you don't want that so there are many multiple reasons why do you want why do you want to clean the water high resistivity all organic and organic suspended solid solid particles microorganisms should be removed the gases and they're not removed oxygen silica metals what we call toc total organic concentration have their specific numbers that tends to be below that number so whole lot of processing has to be done on the water want less than 10 parts per billion of toc and where they come from naturally occurring microorganisms organic matter man made organic based chemicals all sorts of things are there in tap water which is good for drinking not good for processing why 2000 gallons per way for i mean we don't we're not going to use that much water in there we'll see how much you get into that yeah we at the end of every cleaning process there is something called di water rinse 
clear water rinse is where you hold the wafer and you put it in, in flowing water. You rinse it. So the book says mostly five minutes rinse. So it means your tap is running for five minutes and just for one wafer. In industry, of course, you have the cassettes where you are flowing water to remove whatever is there. Does it take more than a gallon of water to make a gallon of the eye water? I have no idea. <laughs> Look at the specs of the eye water system. Yeah. They should have this information. So what we want is to remove particles, remove bacteria. How do we kill bacteria? How can we live? How can we kill living things in water? Heat it, right? But there are organisms that live in hot springs also. Well, we know those all over the world. They have these springs which are hot water, sulfur. They have living things in those water as well. Pardon? Using some chemicals. Chemicals. Right, then we'll have to remove chemicals. UV, I think your best bet is to filter, right? UV. Filters, yes, you will remove things, but they can be living things smaller than 200 nanometer inches. I mean, do we really care if they're living or not? Because if even a dead bacterium is still going to contaminate your device. Right, so I want to filter it, of course, but I want to kill it also. I see. So, those, they don't pass through filter and result into colonies. They can still oh, I see. create colonies. So, want to kill that. UV is the easiest way to kill living things. Right? That's why we have these glasses with UV, which protect UV and the sunscreen which protects UV because UV results in the mutation of DNA, ultimately kills the thing. So UV is, is something that we pass the water through and then we filter. So uh, what it does is it changes the, the, the organic matter. And living things have lots of organic stuff results into carbon dioxide and water. So bacteria, we, what we aim at is less than one CFU per ml. For bacteria, the unit is CFU per ml, colony forming units per ml. So if they are not killed, just filtered, some of them would pass through, they'll start forming their own colonies. So bacteria are counted as CFU per ml. So we want to do that to destruct ozone as well. What is ozone? O3. O3. What is good about ozone or bad about it? What is good about ozone? Absorbs UV. Right? What happens when it absorbs UV? Breaks down into simpler units, oxygen. But it's highly unstable, which means it reacts easily. It corrodes the piping. If it corrodes the piping, we can use it to clean the piping as well, because something that corrodes, it means it's gonna take away material from the surface of that pipe. We want to control how much we clean. We don't want to, to eat away the pipes. So we want to remove ozone, but we want to use it as a system sanitizer also controlled amount of ozone. But that's also something that's coming with water. Okay. And then this is water. So every step requires every cleaning step would most of the cleaning step would require water prints at the end. Many times it's not the first thing is not just to clean it, first thing is to neutralize the reaction that is going on. If I dip it, if I dip a silicon wafer, silicon dioxide, a wafer which has silicon dioxide, I dip it in, what do we use to etch silicon dioxide? You etch. I didn't want to get that right now, but I'll do it. So it's very important, always remember that you'll see a lot of it. BHF, buffered hydro, Chloric acid, it's also called buffered oxide etch. So it's used from one to, I think, six to one to 10 ratio of DI water, water to acid. So we dilute acid. 
course, when you dilute, six times would be water in there. So, say if I dip my wafer, oxidized wafer into BHF, and I've timed it, so in one minute I'm done with how much etching I want to do, I take it out. How do I stop the reaction right here? Because some of BHF is going to be on the wafer. What do I do? Yes. Put it in water in beaker full with beer water. Rinsing will still not be consistent right away. But a beaker full of beer water, if I dip it in, it's going to dilute BHF right away. Right? So I can pretty much control the reaction, stop right away. So that's also, and you'll, you'll read another typical word, conspicuous amount of DI water, so which means something which is a lot of DI water that can neutralize the reaction. So it's just one example. Many, many reactions that we do in liquid, so first thing is to take it out and put it into a beaker with DI water, so we can stop the reaction, at least retard it to a great extent. So that is for the DI water, in order to do it for rinsing. Stopping injection. Where else do we get contamination from? During processes, we do deposition. The deposition is done where you might be physically depositing something or reacting some compounds on the surface, which result into material that gets deposited. So it might have some byproducts, which we do all our efforts to suck out from that chamber, but some of that can get back on the substrate, get back on the wall. Some of that can stick to the walls. We will be going through this over and over. So when we go in chemical vapor deposition, we'll look at this again. So if you feel that it's too much knowledge <coughs> and it's new, yes, but we'll see it at many places. So don't feel overwhelmed with this. So many processing, almost all processes will result into into byproducts, whether it's chemical vapor deposition, CVD, whether it's etching, where we pump in certain gases which etch away certain material, and they would may cause flaking of the. So, if this is a chamber and I'm placing my wafer there and I'm pumping my gas from here, or maybe here, and I'm sucking from one of these openings, the products that come out, there will be still some that will, the reaction which will flake the sidewall, sputter material, remove some material which can deposit it on the sidewalls of the chamber or on the paper itself. And it can result into some byproducts which are polymeric, which are long chain molecules. It can come from the handling of the wafer from features. It can come from the gas o-rings or parts that move. So it's many, many places that we can get contamination from within a process. So they can not just deposit, they can create charges also. They can create electrostatic charging of this of the surfaces as well. And if you don't clean the chamber, and cleaning is not always a manual process where you have to wash the dishes. You can just put the dishes in the dishwasher and turn the button on. So there are processes which are clean processes. So especially remember that oxygen is always a very strong cleaner. Very good. Wherever there is oxygen involved in a process, it's a vigorous process. So to clean a chamber, we do a process called oxygen D scum. So scum is formation of different materials. D scum is removing that material. Oxygen D scum is a cleaning process. We do that very often. Many times I would I would always do a de-scum before I do my process. And to be nice, with the next user I will do it at the end of the process. We don't do de-scum with a wafer inside. 
the duet or an empty chamber. Right? So what so kind of devices do we do this in? What kind of? What kind of devices do we do this oxygen these come in? Is it oh, empty chamber. We just want to clean the chamber. So it is done on <coughs> plasma. Any plasma system <coughs> will have a DSCUM recipe. Recipe means the combination of gas flow, temperature, how much power we have to provide. So when I, before I do the actual process, I will just run that DSCUM process, which will make sure the inner walls of the chamber are cleaned up. And then I will open and place my wafer and then I will do recipe of whatever I was supposed to do. So we do this a lot of time to reduce <coughs> cross contamination. Something that was happened before shouldn't affect what I'm doing. Alright. <coughs> How do we clean wafers? How do we clean say Let's start with tweezer. How do you think <coughs> get a new tweezer? What should I do to get rid of anything? We start with something called solvent cleaning. Now, solvent is simply stated something can dissolve <coughs> other things, right? So solvent in this case we consider as non acidic, non basic solution. What are those solutions which are not acids, not base? Acetone, alcohol. <coughs> so acetone is a very good cleaner, very good solvent. What we do is we dip maybe one wafer or right, tweezers in a beaker filled with acetone. Leave it there for <coughs> leave it there for ten minutes. Just gonna remove everything. The the nail polish moment has very small concentration of acetone. That's why it can be used. Acetone is a <coughs> it's not a good solution. We don't want to inhale it. So but first step is we put it in a beaker inside the inside the solvent hood. <coughs> we leave it there for 10 minutes. Now once I take it out, it's gonna dry off. Acetone dries off very quickly. It will have residues of acetone in it. Now how do I do it? What do I do with it? I dip it in methanol. Methanol is gonna dissolve acetone, right? So acetone, I used it to dissolve any organic material. And methanol, I use to remove acetone. After <coughs> methanol, I can just rinse it in with clean water. And that's the process called solvent cleaning. Before I go into these much more involved processes, solvent cleaning is a simple process which gets rid of many, many basic organ organic materials. <coughs> I can use solvent clean or wafers as well. It's a comparatively very delicate, very, <coughs> should say delicate, but relatively it's less harsh of cleaning. And when I use acids in any type of cleaning, those are harsh treatments. So if I have devices which are <coughs> very small features, maybe I have some metal deposited which is 10 nanometers wide. I want to stay with solvent clean. I don't want to do acid treatment there. So it will depend on your judgment what, what kind of cleaning you want to do. So now, going back to the standards, what we're going to do, is how do we clean wafers? So, any every cleaning step. <coughs> but require your understanding of what is already there on the substrate. If there are many, many layers of devices that have been made, we may not be able to do certain cleaning steps because they can destroy those devices that has happened before. So those are then divided <coughs> into what we call <coughs> FEUL and BUL locations during the process. So front end is where we have nothing, we just have simple silicon or maybe silicon dioxide. We don't have too many layers made up yet, <coughs> not too many metals deposited there, so it's called front end of line. We have much more room for what we can do. Right? We can use aggressive chemicals. But once we put 
metals and different layers are there, we have very small window what can be done. And we can only use less reactive one, so to speak, tender reactions to do that. So front end of line, a very popular one is called Prana. Prana is mixture of <coughs> hydrogen peroxide and sulfuric acid. From your experience or knowledge, tell me what happens when you mix acid and bases in equal amounts. What do you expect? They neutralize each other. And they neutralize each other? Okay, that's least of my worries. <coughs> they really see. They will? There, there will be a lot of heat involved. Lots of heat. Explosion. They will blow unless I add acid in the reaction. Right? So my question had a basic flaw that what happens when you add them? It's going to be big explosion. Very, very exothermic reaction. Unless I add acid to hydrogen peroxide. Right? Now, what would, if, say, if I have one to one of both, <coughs> or if I have one to three, I have three times of hydrogen, so I have sulfuric acid, which one is going to be more aggressive? Once to three or once to one? Once to one. Once to? One. Okay, let me say it again. If I have once to three and three times is sulfuric acid, H2O2 to H2SO4, one to three. Say if I have, it says seven to three here. I'm saying one to three. So if I have one to three and one to one, Which one is going to be more aggressive? Probably the one to three. three. This one or this one? I guess one to three. One to three. A lot more acid is reacting there. Right? So, of course, it's going to neutralize. Essentially, when the whole hydrogen peroxide is used up, but you have much more sulfuric acid to do that reaction. So, you have many more of sulfuric acid that doesn't <coughs> react, but you have the whole reaction is very aggressive, much more aggressive. So we use, okay, standard is what book says, seven to three. We use one to one, we use one to two, one to three, many, many different ratios of it. So if you use, okay, yeah, now I see what I'm saying. I was, I was thinking the other round. I was thinking first hydrogen peroxide and then sulfuric acid. So, yes. So here it's almost double. 3 to 6 would be 1 to 2, so it's 7 to 3. Sorry about flipping the order here. And it gives highly exothermic, very, very hot range. During that reaction, what it does to the wafer is it etches away <coughs> whatever is there on the surface. Right? Okay, so there was supposed to be an explosion if you add them. What else would happen if you add two? acid and base together, there can be lots of heat generated, lots of bubbles that will come out, right? There'll be a gas formation in that process, right? <coughs> so that bubbling results into cavitation, it etches materials. So we use that many times for simple cleaning, gets rid of almost everything. RCA was, RCA was a company, electronics company, equivalent to maybe <coughs> Toshiba, JVC in US, USA. So RCA was an electronics company. So they developed this process. So they are called RCA clean processes. RCA's <coughs> name doesn't mean anything about the chemicals or whatever, but it was developed by that company. Then there is called standard clean, where we have water, again a base, and hydrogen peroxide. It gets rid of organic films, metals, and particles. <coughs> to remove oxide, we use, I said that before, BHF, it's also called BOE, buffered oxide etch. Remember always, whenever I say oxide, it's going to be removed. 
simple thing is BHF. We always do BHF. Its H rate is 1000 angstroms per minute. Normally. <coughs> How many nanometers in one angstrom? 0 0.1. 0.1. Start the playing with these. Extrem to nanometer to micron, right? 10 is to a minus 6 micron, 10 is to a minus 9 nano, <coughs> 10 is minus 10 is angstrom. So we use this angstrom and nanometer alternatively. We talk to them. And then there's what they call standard clean 2. Again, now this one has acid, hydro <coughs> hydrochloric acid in there. It gets rid of atomic and ionic compound. In all cases, what we do is de rinse and dry. And we store them in nitrogen. <coughs> Why nitrogen? Why do we choose nitrogen ambient? Nitrogen is global. Nitrogen doesn't react at room temperature. So we do nitrogen for that. There are different ways how do we do rinse. We'll talk about that next time. <coughs> Generally, the simple is water rinse. You open it and, and then there's something called cascade where you have a sort of a, a river of three compartments where the air water is, first one is filled with the air water, flows, overflows into the lower one, overflows into the third one, which is lowest in height. Right? So we start with, tell me something, should I start with the top one or should I start <coughs> with the lower one? Just lower one, top one. Top one? Okay, if I start with the top one, it has clean, got some chemical out of my wafer <coughs> that is flowing to the next one, to the next. So which one should I start rinsing, the top one or the lowest one? Cascade is nothing but a container which has three pockets. The, the, we flow, we fill the top one with the air water, the water overflows, comes to the next one, that overflows with the, go to the next one. There's a continuous flow of water. So when I have my wafer, I need to rinse it. Should I start with the lowest one? Or start the with the lowest one and then go to the. Then go to the upper one. Because so well, you're trying to uh, success successively, successively make it cleaner, clean right? the wafer <coughs> and cleaner the air water. Right? We'll talk about it later on. Any questions? I think the next professor is here already. No questions? I'll oh, so see you on Tuesday. We have one more class before we start. We won't go to the lab. Right? No, we will start lab from February 8th. February 8th. That was the announcement that this. February 8th. That was the announcement at the start of the lecture. And there was a homework assigned. This slide I'll post up on Blackboard. There's a homework, four questions of homework. You can take a look at that on there. If you didn't get the handout which I gave out today, you can take this copy from me now. If you guys have not done this statement of ethics form, turn it in to me next week or this week. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there from 2.45. Okay? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's a simple. Not cheap, but very nice. Yeah. <coughs> oh, you remember telling us last semester that for some wavelengths of light, there is their refractive optics. Like for some some systems, you know, you have to have mirrors to focus. 
Yeah. I just found out there is a fish that has refractive eyes. It's called okay. a spook fish. It's very interesting. I, I was thinking about that. And I'm like, wow, it's, it's like those UV exposure systems. Uh -huh. It's got a mirror in the back and the retinas in the front. That's interesting. It's the most fascinating thing I've heard. Fish. <coughs> so anything we can think of has been thought of before. Yeah, but you can... That's called biomimic, biomimicking. So if you come across something, maybe, maybe they have replicated it. Synthetic words. That might have some interesting It's true. It's true. It's true. <coughs> Many of these things, we had no tools to replicate these things synthetically before. I guess we still don't have some of them, right? Because I know there are people working about uh, gecko teeth, now from. Yeah? It's a few lizards are these nano hooks. Since I'm not sure where he wants it to be this time, he's going to be somewhere in the street. Preacher here? I can do this. 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 You know, a tap well here and a tap well here, you've got plenty of room so you won't break the bottle down there. Man, that'd work. Bottle of water. Oh, That's bottle of water. Yeah. Hey, you need one of them old time bottles. I thought it was a paper weight. <laughs> Put that on top of your desk. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Put somebody under the desk and she don't slide around. It's an envelope holder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They all sort of it, man. You know, there's the jump. Oh, they did. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was wet. I know. Or you could use it to kill a lot of things. Probably use it to kill a lot of things. Computer right there. It's a lot of things. No.